The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bill, season ticket holder Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger. And we are here talking about training camp week one. Week one is finally in the books. One of the, Chris, what is it? It's it's really not that long. Training camp in and of itself, like we've been waiting for this for so long. What is it? Three and a half weeks? Something like that. The first preseason game is when? Next weekend? Mm, maybe. And then there's another week of camp, and then there's like camp ends, and then you have two more preseason games? It's possible. Do you want to start with what you missed? What? I don't know. Uh, this is. You were at Potter's wedding and you missed out the cover one. On the yep. cover one yep. meetup at yep. Fally Allen. Let me. So I, I told Jessica, I was like, for me, cover one meetup is the number one thing that I look forward to from a social event all year long. So... Because you don't have friends. <laughs> yeah, there's... <laughs> all I need is Jessica in my life. That's it. Aww, That's all I need. Aw, look at you. <laughs> yeah. Aww. All right. So I told her, I was like, well, this is like... This is like my party night. Cover one meetup. So we go to... We Ubered. First of all, because we're responsible people, we Ubered down to Fally Allen and had some drinks. We Ubered home at like 930. And then I remember I got a text message Saturday morning from Jessica, who was laughing about the idea of my definition of my party night. Yeah, we we go out. And have one, maybe two more drinks than we should in between 6 and 10 p.m. And then we go home. Because <laughs> we're, we're in our 30s. Like, I'm not going to be out until midnight. We go party from like 6 to 10. Have some cocktails, which, by the way, Fally Allen, excellent cocktails. Minus no clarified ice. They, didn't ever, they did not have... <laughs> Clarified ice. They didn't have your fancy bullshit ice. No. You know what they did have? And I what? told Greg Thompson to get. Hmm. I said, order an old fashioned, get the Woodenville. Hmm. He had a Well this this also this happened. First of all, Greg Thompson walks in. A you can't miss him. B Is that a fat joke? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. B, I don't I don't talk to him for like a good 10 minutes since he gets there so he he gets he gets there he's goes to the bar and he orders a high noon i see him at the other end of the bar drinking a high noon and he finally comes over and says hello to me and jessica and i said hey just so you know if you need it Jessica has tampons in, in her purse if you need it. <laughs> and then, ah. Jessica always has to blow up my spot because she's she was like, he's been sitting on that joke for 10 minutes <laughs> since, <laughs> since he saw you order a high noon. So your lady won't just let you get a solid burn off? No, I am. I meet it like you cannot. You buzz admit, the tower yeah. on Greg Thompson and she won't just let you have that? No, no. And like... But Greg had a Greg had a, a point of like, oh, we've been at camp, we've been, you know, post camp, we've been, you know, drinking hard. Like you got to start with a high noon. Now, mind you, one of I wanted to say one. I would say the biggest supporter of what we do in mm -hmm. the podcast community showed up, Eric Smeal. Eric Smith, dude, guys, he, for those of you who he, don't know Eric, he is one of the best human beings I've ever met. 
I talk to him. I text him. I don't think he understands because he's not like he hasn't gotten to know me yet, Chris. He hasn't been to the house yet. He hasn't been brought under the tent the way he did guys mention like that Justin Yulberg has, and the way. But, but what they're gonna find out is that you're a good dude, and I only collect good people. Yeah, well, this because other people can't let handle me. me. Let me get to other this. Other people don't want to be around guys like me. Let me get to this. So, we were already there before Eric Smeal showed up. I forget what Jessica's first cocktail was, but I had a Black Manhattan. Black Manhattan, phenomenal cocktail at Fally Allen. I told Eric that's what I was. I'm like, I got a Black Manhattan. They're really good. <laughs> and he's, I'm standing next to him, and he turns. The bartender finally comes over to him, and he was like, "Yeah, let me have a Black Manhattan double." <laughs> and the guy goes, "We can't do that, sir." And then Eric, without missing a beat, well, just give me two of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> what, there we go. What? It's like, oh okay, boy. Okay, you're not gonna give me a double. Of, okay, we'll put two this in its separate like glasses and give them to me. And then after the Black Manhattans, he just started drinking uh, just bourbon straight. Give me a, a glass full of bourbon. And I don't this know. This is why I. I don't love know it. how he face planted. To the floor like Chris Farley and Tommy Boy after he hit the bong and went through the coffee table. This I don't know how Eric Smeal didn't do that. You know why? Because he's built like me where we just hang. And that's why I love him. I love this dude. He's 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 wired like us. He's good people. I love the fact that you had fun at that thing. I had a blast at the wedding I was going to. It sucked because you weren't there. Anthony Prohaska didn't come, even though it was talked about that he was Ooh, coming. And Prohas, that's bad form. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna rib him about this. And no Aaron Quinn, because he was already to his private island in Maine. Oh, I was gonna say because he walked up the. I made the joke that his his chin strap facial hair to a bald head is like a staircase that just runs into a ceiling. <laughs> like it's. Just, I was like, he just took the staircase to nowhere. Fuck you. Ah, God. I like the cover one, guys. I love me some Eric Smeal. It was a I'm great happy, time. There's I'm probably about had fun. 30 people that showed up. Okay, good. Awesome. I'm glad you had a good time. The reality is, is that this thing, Bill's training camp, has become a real thing. It's become, a, uh, Chris, a phenomenon. Yes. The team had to respond to criticism last year that there was no tickets available. To the point where they cut down as season ticket holders, our... Oh, look at that! Guys, we're watching the Hall of Fame game. The Bills are 43% favorites, according to Sunday Night Football, to win the AFC East. Oh, but not if you work at ESPN! Those fucking dickheads. I mean, we could get into that. No, I'm not gonna. <laughs> what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about training camp. Training camp is this special time of year where everybody's excited about everything. Things are good. Everyone's happy about their team, and we all love getting together and doing these things. Cover One comes in every year. They do these events. Everyone loves to go out to them. Realistically, I go there to network with the people who we have mutual like friends with. I did get to meet um, If the Walls Could Talk podcast that's on Cover One yeah? and Cover One's uh, sponsor. There you go. Well, uh, wait, uh, Uncle Jumbo? No, not Uncle Jumbo. That's not a thing. Okay. No, somebody, they got a new sponsor. I talked to one of the reps. All right. Well, I'll talk to you about that when we get off this podcast. So what? Uh, Don't worry, I had nothing good to say about you. <laughs> and this is why I love you. Guys, we're here to talk about the first week of training camp, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because realistically, there's no other way to break it all down. The good is where you want to start. You want to edge into this. You want to say, hey, here's all the things that went really well this week. First of all, veterans that people were concerned about showed up. Chris, Trey White. Remember when they said they were doing like some like some scoping on his knee? Yeah. Midway through like OTAs and shit like that. And you're like, well, that might speak to the fact the team might want to restructure his contract. 
and they just want to make sure he's actually healthy. Guys, his play, he's back. All I need to see is the video. It's him, it's Gabe Davis. Gabe Davis has how many pounds and how many inches on him? Trey White's under six. Gabe Davis is six foot four. Gabe Davis has a giant wingspan. Trey White, nah. He's in his pocket. The pass hits Gabe Davis's hands. It's a great sideline catch. Trey White punches it out. Why? Because he's fucking Trey White. He's good at what he does. You do not complete balls on him. Gabe Davis looks the part through camp now that he's healthy, his ankle injury is healed. He looks like a wide receiver, too. He looks like the explosive option we thought we were getting last year when we hedged as a team our bets on that guy being the thing that was going to give our passing attack juice. Never mind the fact that they have a Khalil Shakir, they have a Hardy, they have now they have smaller, fast guys who can get downfield. Gabe Davis finally looks the part, and that's great. And then you obviously have the Mitch Morrises of the world. You have the Daquan Joneses who have showed up and just been who they are. I, Chris, I don't think you can underscore the value of the fact that, like, as we're going to kind of question some of our, d- during this week's AFC's Roundup podcast, we're going to question some of our divisional f- friends about how their teams are doing, and the Patriots in particular have this problem where all the names they brought in are struggling. All of them. Either the ones that were currently on the roster, the ones that they brought in. Outside of Juju Smith-Schuster, I don't know of a single name player who's really shown well. At least the Bills have that. Stephon Diggs, the guy that everyone goes, Oh, if Stephon Diggs isn't engaged, I don't know. This team could fall apart. Chris, how's that gone? That whole narrative went up pretty quickly, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Diggs is out here balling. He's making sideline catches. He's punking He's punking linebackers in something that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But he's making his presence felt. He is the Stefan Diggs that we've all come to know and love. He's the same fiery, competitive guy. And that's all you could ask for. Also... Dalton Kincaid has been showing off why he was a first-round draft pick. If you follow cover one, they've been all over this for the entire week with all their training camp coverage about how fluid of a fucking athlete Dalton Kincaid is, about how smooth he is in and out of his breaks. There's video. There's everything. You watch him snap his route off. Like the Bills PR department puts out a video and you watch him snap his route off in front of a linebacker's face, make a catch and turn up field. You know who used to like this is where the swole Beasley thing comes from. We're getting to see it. It's because he's doing the things Beasley used to do, except he's instead of being like the guy who has to settle in in between the linebackers, catch the ball, turn up field and get small and try to squeeze for yards. He's the guy who goes, hey. I'm just as fluid, but also I'm fucking bigger than you. I'm six foot four, 240. Don't touch me. And he, he does Josh Allen shit when he gets in the open field. He's stiff arming. He's shouldering. Chris, that's a game changer for this offense. True or false? True. I see this. And I go, everyone's going, okay, this is cool. He's doing it in training camp, blah, 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 blah. Let's see him do it when it's live. Well, I'll tell you some of the research that I did. Like, it points to why this is so important for him to be TE2, but also why what he's showing this first week and hopefully what he expands on entering the preseason, it continues because I looked at some of Dawson Knox's stats historically. Dawson Knox in 2022. I'm looking at this now. 1.1 yards per route run, which is the lowest of any tight end getting 70 or more targets. He finished 14th, right? 53rd among all tight ends. 14th among any tight end getting 70 or more targets. But if you open the field, he's not even in the conversation. 
against man coverage, he tied for eighth in targets with twenty twenty with twenty two. That seems low, doesn't it? Yeah. 22 targets for a tight end against man coverage seems low. He was eighth in yards, second in touchdowns to Kelsey with five on 22 targets. That means roughly about one-fourth of all the targets that he got in man coverage went for touchdowns. When you think about what that means about a guy's skill set, it means he's a red zone weapon. He has short area quicks, but he's not an elite separator down the field when passed off onto safeties. Against zone coverage, which backs this narrative of mine with the safeties up, double the number of targets against him that he had when he was in man. He tied for 15th in the NFL with David Njoku <laughs> in terms of overall production. And all of his stats take a monster hit. He fell in yards after the catch touchdowns, yards per route run. This is why Dalton Kincaid has to acclimate quickly. When opposing defenses play our tight ends in man in the red zone, Knox is a monster. Think think back to the touchdown he scored right in front of us in that Miami game. The sliding, I'm falling down catch. Think about Chris, again, in our end zone, you were there to see it with me, the playoff game against the Patriots. Yeah. Man coverage, and they lost him. <laughs> this man just lost him. And he's like, fuck it, I'm going up for a toe tapper. And he got it. All of that goes away in the middle of the field when teams do what they do to the Buffalo Bills, and they play a lot of zone. Dawson Knox can beat man coverage, but he can't beat zone because he's not as fluid a route runner. So you pair him with a Dalton Kincaid who can snap off a route just because he's got flexible hips. And you watch the way he turns in this giant catch radius. He just gets it. And once it's in his hands, he's bigger than everybody in the secondary. This is a, it's a gross mismatch by default. And the fact that we have that like, I don't know. You can run 12. I don't, I don't give a fuck what you want to do. You can run 12 personnel. You can run 22. You can run the wishbone for all I care. If you can get Knox and Kincaid both playing well at the tight end position with Kincaid's ability to separate that he's already shown through one week, I don't know how most defensive, like defensive coordinators are now going to have a problem to deal with. Because your linebackers and safeties can't account for both of these guys while also trying to corral the outside threats that we have. We need Kincaid to be this guy. And so far, through one week, he's looked the part. Right? It'll be interesting to see what happens as training camp gets more physical. It was nice to see that when the pads came on, he didn't disappear. He kept making plays. Because that's always the thing. Like, Matt Milano had a beautiful play on him, apparently, the one day at training camp. But that doesn't change the narrative that, okay, it takes an all-pro to shut that guy down, but otherwise, he's going to eat. He's going to find targets. He's going to find wins against other linebackers in the NFL. That bodes well for Buffalo, doesn't it? Yeah. And then also, the defense looks aggressive under Sean McDermott. They're sending blitz packages that multiple people have commented, we haven't seen this level of diversity in a while. Sean McDermott is a very different dude than Leslie Frazier. We've talked about that. Leslie Frazier was the, hey, we'll die a death by a thousand paper cuts before we let you, like, we'll, we will be the Tampa 2 Ben Don't Break. Sean McDermott's never been that guy. He's cover three. I'm going to come at you. I'm going to put a rover. I'm going to play a safety in the box, and you don't know which one's dropping, which one's dropping deep, which one's going to cycle into the box, which one's going to cycle out and go cover a cornerback so that my, my cornerback can blitz. He sends a lot of unorthodox blitzes. And so far, our offensive line has paid the price for that. <laughs> our offense has paid the price for that. 
it's nice seeing that that aggressiveness exists and that it's not just folklore. That we're not just all convincing ourselves that Sean McDermott doesn't have his own bag. Like, when we talk about Ken Dorsey being in his bag, yeah, it's a very shallow one. Last year we were like, oh, he ran out of plays. It's nice to see that when Sean McDermott goes to his bag of plays, it's something that none of us have ever, or at least haven't seen in a long time here in, in, uh, as Bills fans. You're watching pressure coming from multiple places. They'll overload the A-gap and then bail out. But then also they'll just run through it. They'll overload the guard and then just truck them. <laughs> They're like, listen, we're sending three guys. Good luck, offense. Whoever's playing quarterback, deal with the pressure. Here you go. Get it out quick. And so that makes me happy because I feel like this defense, in a way to kind of hide the middle linebacker wart that we have, might be best served being aggressive with faster linebackers, correct? Makes sense. All right. Now, with that, I have to move on to what the bad parts of the week were. So we all have to drop the sunshine, the rainbows, and we have to kind of, all right, let's all, to, in fact, I'm going to crack a fresh beer for this. We all have to take a deep breath and goose fraba. You know what's funny? During Potter's wedding, it was the hottest day of the entire summer, both in terms of heat index and humidity. Hottest day. And we're out there in three-piece suits. I've got my kid out there in a fucking vest and a wool suit. He looked fine on Facebook. Yeah, no, he was great. You know who you can thank for that? Fucking this guy. I somehow quarterbacked my son through a marathon wedding. His bedtime is usually 8 o'clock. He was still at the reception at 8 o'clock, and he was having a great time because we managed the day well. And I managed him well. I gave him tasks. I go, hey, you see this really pretty ring box? You have to walk that out to Uncle James. When he when he I calls tell him you, Uncle James. Uncle James. Sure it's not Aunt James. He's gonna fight you. She's gonna dude, I'm telling you, she's just gonna beat you up in front of everybody. How embarrassing is it gonna be for you to get beat up by a woman in front of all your friends? I'm not gonna answer that. No, you'll just have to live it. It's no, gonna be fucking I could amazing. answer that, but I'm not. It's gonna be amazing. So Here's Jack just being a fucking champion. And, like, I see this. And we're at this, like, we're at the wedding. We're at the thing. We're, <laughs> I'm just thinking about how, I don't know. He eventually, like, eventually it goes south, right? Everything does. <laughs> it ha oh, well, according to your wife, uh. He demanded all the croutons. Like, he starts Nailed holding it. you hostage. And you start finding out, you're like, well, this isn't... Everyone sees the funny pictures on... Uh, they're they're going to look at the wedding photos and go, that little boy was such a dream. And they see my wife's photos on Facebook. They go, Jack's so cute. Oh, my God, this is amazing. And I go, you didn't see the parts of this night where he was a fucking terrorist. I feel like a lot of people who are very happy about our training camp are, is going aren't seeing this transition like i managed him throughout the course of the day he had a great day but then he turned at the end and it was hard and nobody noticed that it was hard and i feel like that's what's happening right now because right now the the bills offensive line the talk of the last two days of camp is that the defense looks amazing these pressure packages look amazing like Okay, great, wonderful. They're winning. What what are they winning against? What is our offensive line doing to instill any confidence in anybody? And I'll tell you what. You follow any writer who's been at camp, any podcaster of choice. I'm sure I've I've listened to Joe. Chris, I'll tear it on the fourth wall for our listeners. Once every summer. I don't do it in season, but during the summer, I do like a tour de France. And I listen to everybody else's podcasts. I actually try to listen to at least one or two. And I try to gauge, like, what do I like? What do I don't like about their approach? Blah, 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 blah. One of the things I have not heard yet is this idea that everybody who's pumped about the offensive line, the defensive line needs to pump the brakes and consider who the fuck they're playing on the offensive line. 
like any fan with intelligence realizes it's easy until the pad goes on to win. Because, Chris, you can't block. Yeah. There's no real blocking going on. So everything's meaningless. Tuesday sounded like a bloodbath. For our offense. Uh, Connor McGovern got shredded by multiple starters in the defensive line. Floyd got all of Spencer Brown. And in one-minute drills, both the first-team and second-team offense went 0 for 8 on passing plays. Chris, Allen to Diggs to Davis to Knox to Cook. You couldn't complete a fucking pass? I'm sorry. That frustrates me. Now, again, I'm not going to get too hyperbolic about it. The season's not over because he couldn't do it. It's training camp. But also, it's discouraging to know that that collection of talent couldn't complete a single passing play. Because of the state of the offensive line. Like, as a defense, you'd have to be the 85 Bears or the 2000 Ravens to do that in a real NFL football game. Right? Yeah. Our defense is not the 85 Bears of the 2000 Ravens. No, no one's killed anyone. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I, this is what I love about our show. We're allowed to do things like this. Uh, it just it frustrates me knowing that this line looks very good, and I have to... I, I, I want to believe that Puna Ford is showing out the way that he is. I want to believe... That Daquan Jones, Ed Oliver is just having a, res- like he's responding to the contract that we gave him. I want to believe this. The problem is you have to look at what's happening on the offensive line. I mean, if we really look at it, first of all, our pass protection is a fucking disaster. Can we talk about the fact that David Edwards, remember how I talked him up? Yeah, yeah came from the Rams. Line, our offensive line preview. He got reps with the starters in place of Connor McGovern. He got... Our third string guard got reps with the ones. I want to I put this into a box so that you guys, our listeners, can understand this. What they did was they saw that their $8 million guard that they just signed in free agency was struggling in pass protection, and they replaced him with the third stringer. David Edwards. Now, I say third stringer because you would have assumed that Torrance or Bates would play either guard spot, right? Mm hmm. So, this is what I love. Bates and Torrance are locked into what is one of camp's purest competitions. They are literally trading off days, trading off reps, half days, splitting things with the first team. There is a real competition here. But what's telling about what they think about Ryan Bates is that when Conor McGovern goes down in 2021, that is where Ryan Bates took all of his snaps at guard. Yet now, when he struggled and they felt like they had to put, push him back, they didn't put Torrance in right guard and shift Bates over to le- left guard. They brought up the third stringer and instead put Ryan Bates on the second team. Makes sense. That tells you right there that they, they've they seen all they're willing to take of Ryan Bates at left guard. And that makes you wonder if this competition isn't all of a sudden kind of slanted towards Torrance where they're like, hey, we're doing the thing where we put the veteran in front of you and we're, we're just hoping you win. Does that make sense? Perfect sense. God. Sometimes, right? This McDerm- dickhead knows what he's talking about. McDermott's not going to give any uh, rookie the just the flat out edge. If he's got a veteran to put in front of you, he's going to do it. And that's where I love having this level of nuance and being able to have these conversations. Now, I love what we do here. I really do. You know what I don't love is the fact that Spencer Brown hurt his fucking back today. No, God. No, God, please, no, no, no. (laughs) Allegedly, he was riding an electric bike around campus. So maybe it's not so bad, but they were like, oh, he couldn't bend over and pick up his helmet. 
Chris, that's not good. I mean, I have back issues. That is, an, I've had back issues for three years. Let's talk about that. Wait a if, minute. If didn't you I, fight with your? Didn't you fight with your doctor about this? Like you, you would not give them your medical records because they were dicks to you about it. Oh no! I recently got a back X-ray, and let's see. I and they where said, I hey, go, and they well, said, wait a minute. We 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 looked at your scans. It turns out you're soft. <laughs> No, I got back x-rays because since I've been with Jessica, I now have like a practice I go to because that's like a thing you need to have as somebody in your late, very late 30s is to have a legit doctor. But I go where Jessica goes. And when I went for like my initial checkup, I brought everything all past related medical issues, my shoulder, my back, and my ankle. And I was like, I brought all this if you want this. And they're like, oh, no, that's not necessary. Now my back's flittering up again. Oh, you've had X. Can we? No, you can't see him because you said they weren't necessary. (laughs) Something that I had done three years ago, not necessary to look at. Maybe even let's get new x-rays on your back and let's compare them to three years ago and how they look. Oh, we can't do that because you're not giving us your original back x-rays. Yeah, because you said they weren't necessary. (laughs) My medical past, not necessary. So go fuck yourself. But uh, now that my... I love that Chris fights with doctors the way I fight with him. Now that my... (laughs) Since my accident here is healed, mostly healed, I am. I have tomorrow. I'm going to make a call to go to um, what is what that PT physical therapy to get my back done. <laughs> then I can get an MRI. Wait, you have to go to PT first? Yes. Jesus. Because an MRI is wickedly expensive. So an insurance Who cares? company. You're making all that sweet tire money. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, so here's the thing that I also look at when I'm thinking about things that are not going well. Tyrell Dodson is leading the middle linebacker competition. Like, I, eh, uh, Tyrell Dodson. Chris, that's your guy. Chris, do me a favor. While I, while I talk about this, can you pull up Spo track? free agent tracker look at who's available on the linebacker market so here's the problem i see the buffalo bills have tried to go into this linebacker competition and brandon bean said everyone's gonna get a shot and out of the first couple days yeah balen specter was thrown into the mix it was terrell bernard and then it was dodson and then they drafted dorian williams and everyone goes well maybe that's the guy dorian williams when he's on the field, plays weak side linebacker. So, Chris, you've now drafted year after year after year weak side linebacker prototypes and then have this glaring hole in middle linebacker. It's really frustrating. It's really frustrating for me as a fan to watch. But so with that, what I hate to hear is that, and again, it's nothing against Tyrell Dodson as a player or as a person. I guess I shouldn't say not against him as a player. What I think is that his ceiling is very limited. It's why you were an undrafted free agent. It's why you are what you are now. It's why you are what you are in the eyes of the NFL. The Bills let you walk and brought you back on a tiny salary. Do you want this uh, broken down inside or outside? Uh, Inside. Inside, please. Zach Cunningham. There we go. So, So here's the thing. When you look at what's going on here, they're talking about Tyrell Dodson is getting the lion's share of the snaps. Bernard is rotating in, and no one can tell. Like, all the people talk about the rotation, right? Every pundit writes about who got snaps where. No one's talking about whether they were good or not. That's not a good thing. If they're not writing about their their successes, it means that they're probably trying to hide the fact that these guys are struggling. I don't love that, and that speaks to the Taylor Rapp thing that we've been talking about, this idea that... Spotrack is only giving 
nine yeah. current UFA inside linebackers. Yes. Only nine. There's nine on the market. So the problem is, is that if, if you get through week two, let's say we head into next week and you find out that this, you know, Terrell Bernard can't win this starting job. Tyrell Dodson, just based on his veteran presence, the fact that he's been in the NFL for three years, he's your guy, but you've watched him play before and you know he can't hold up for 17 games as your starting middle linebacker. Chris, we did we did a deep dive about a month ago where I broke down. We talked about me overreacting to things. This was well in advance of camp. And this is where I'm trying to remind myself, right? Overthinking certain things. Remember when I fell in the chicken wire outside your house? Yeah. I forgot the side gate was open. You don't know how to open a gate. So we don't need a star middle linebacker, right? We need competency. And Dodson can probably give us that. I guess the problem is, is that I want better on a team that I think should be in contention for a Super Bowl. I want better. And I don't know who on this roster can give it to me because if they've already boxed out Spectre and now they're talking about, well, it's Bernard and Dodson rotating. Now what? I've seen Bernard. He's not impressive. And the fact that no one's talking about their actual in-game performance being impressive tells me that they're just bodies fighting for a spot. It doesn't mean they're great. But there's also no one else out there available right now to bring in who you can indoctrinate quickly enough to help you in the regular season. I'm shocked Miles Jack. That's the one that gets me, right? Like, when you look at that, former second-round pick. Also the, youngest on the list. Went to the Jaguars. He was out there. And then, like, he was supposed to be a star. And then he just wasn't. I feel like he's played for the Cowboys. Then he played for who? Click Pittsburgh. That. Click that. Pittsburgh was his last team. Okay, so go career earnings. It'll show us everything. Okay, Jaguars. No, Jaguars and Steelers. I don't know why I thought Miles Jack. No, Jalen Smith was the one. Uh, Jalen, the the guy who from Notre Dame. Yeah. Blew out his knee. That's the guy I'm thinking of. So Miles Jack was a Jaguar forever. Right through his rookie contract. He got that fifth-year option, and then they let him go. Yeah. And then Pittsburgh nabbed him, and no job for this year. That's crazy, isn't it? Second-round pick in 2016, 36 overall. I want to say that what I'm going to be looking for this coming week is I want to hear more positive things about this middle linebacker position. If not, I want to hear more positive things about Taylor Rapp being a big nickel or being whatever. And if I can't hear that, then I want to hear that the team is looking at options. I want to hear that the team is like keeping an eye towards cut down day and towards, Hey, who might be out there on the street with high level athleticism? Who's a veteran who can come in here and maybe help this defense at least tread water. And then there's the ugly (coughs) Chris is the ugly of training camp. Through one week, all I have to say is, for the love of God, stop hitting my fucking quarterback! Chris, they pulled a Philly special type play with Josh Allen where they threw the ball to him and Teron Johnson crashed into him and both of them were hurt in the process. They were like, oh my God, Josh Allen's slow to get up after a collision with Johnson in the end zone. That's a nightmare. Why are you doing this? Why is Josh Allen in the end zone colliding with anybody? Unnecessary. True or false? True. Then Tuesday rolls around this week and they go, well, the pocket just keeps collapsing on Josh Allen, and I think in that fracas, somebody stepped on him, and he had to leave, and he was limping, and then he was over on the sideline, and Brandon Bean came down and was talking to him. Don't step on the quarterback, you dickheads. I get it. You, you're you a football player. You go zero. You, you, you don't know anything but zero or 100. 
But Jesus Christ, that guy is the man. He's the reason we're either going to win or lose. So for the love of God, don't you dare step on him errantly in a fucking practice. It's crazy to me that you have to coach that into players. It's crazy to me that our offensive line doesn't understand that, Chris. Yeah. You'd think they'd want to keep him as safe as possible. Makes sense. And yet here we are. And then staying with the quarterbacks, you know what else is ugly? Matt Barkley. Matt Barkley already looks like practice squad fodder. All the reports, they're saying he doesn't have Kyle Allen's arm strength. That's... It's very apparent. You and I have sat here on this podcast and talked about how they don't trust Barkley, right? Correct. All the times. That Chargers game, I'll never forget it. They brought Barkley in. They bring him in. Allen goes down the tunnel, and everyone's like, oh, my God, he's injured. Here's the thing. Nick, uh, Joey Bosa, or was it Nick Bosa? No, Joey Bosa. They're like, Joey Bosa fucking hurt him. He's gone. They were backup quarterback. They ran the ball four times and punted. <laughs> Chris, you're just like, nah, we're not throwing the ball. We're just not doing it because we don't think this guy is the zip. He'll turn it over. We'd rather just go to halftime and see what happens with Josh's injury. That tells you everything they have. Like, that's what, everything they think about him. So him being here, great, wonderful. I never expect him to see a football field. And now his play on the practice field is showing it. I mean, first of all, this vet savvy he's supposed to have, he's been sailing and skipping screen passes. He's the guy who allowed Puna Ford to get a pick six. Mind you, Chris, no one loves a fat guy touchdown more than us. Correct. Correct. A fat guy scoring a touchdown is fucking sweet in any capacity. Defensive lineman, big, big belly defensive lineman getting a getting an interception for a touchdown is one of the coolest things on earth. Yeah. Remember when Star Latule got that pick during the 2019 uh, Cowboys game? Yeah. Didn't that just set it set the room on fire? Wherever you were watching it. You're like, oh, fat guy interception. Yeah. Everyone loses their shit. Why? Because it's the greatest thing that you've ever seen. Because it either speaks to that fat guy being one of the most fluid athletes anyone's ever seen play the game of football. Or a quarterback making a really poor choice. In this case, it's quarterbacks making bad choices. Matt Barkley will not make this roster. He will be the practice squad guy. They will keep two. It will be Kyle Allen, and that feels like it's already been decided, which is ugly. You kind of hope that he would show a little bit better. I guess the question is, what are you looking for going into week two? Is there anything here that you're going to be paying special attention to? Simple. What happened to Spencer Brown? Mm. Is it... Is it lingering? Is it just a, I don't know, a, I don't know if a tweak is the right word. I think if we start is to it see just, more is, it, is when you can really start to get worried. If you see Questenberry working with the ones, you go, well, that's the guy they've always trusted when he goes out. This could be a problem, right? Yeah. That's a fair way to assess it. What else? What else are you looking for? That's really it. See, for me, there's a couple things. First of all, the Torrance Bates thing is really interesting to me. I love the fact that they're in a pure rotation. I want to hear more about how they fare in 11 on 11. I want to hear that Bates can handle his own. And if he can't, I want to hear that Torrance is, like, because Torrance has been winning his 1v1 reps against second string talent. He's been playing with physicality against starters. I I want to hear that one of these guys is starting to take the battle over. That we have a better picture of who is the best right guard. Because it's clear they're not going to play Bates at left guard. They've already made their point. 
Bates, you have nowhere to go but to win this right guard job. And if you don't, we will slot Torrance in there, and you'll be our you'll be our swing center guard. You'll be our swing interior lineman. And there's no shame in that, right? It's just that's what you'll be. Also, Kyer Elam finished the week hot. After everyone bitching about how he wasn't getting enough time or enough reps or enough shine, today, Thursday, he had a killer practice. Finished with an interception that Josh Allen had to joke about in the postgame, where he was like, well, I just, someone, should, I, someone should have thrown a flag. And then he was like, no, that was a great play. He just boxed out and bodied the receiver, beat him to his spot, and got the ball. That's what they wanted when they drafted him. They need to see more of that from him. But if he can do that on a consistent basis, this churn at CB2 might start to slow down the same way the middle linebacker composition competition is slowing down. You might start to see the fact that it becomes Elam and Dane. And they go, Benford, you're cool. You can be a backup. It's fine. We like we like the depth. You're not getting cut. Don't worry. You're still going to get paid. But Elam is the highest end option, and I want to see him play to that level because if he can if he can do this, and we have two high end cornerbacks, that's how you win a Super Bowl, Chris. Yeah, two high end corners plus the rest of our defense. You can make up for other warts on your defensive unit that way. The other thing that I'm watching is just what happens at running back. Because there's this weird thing where James Cook is electric as a running back. He's a great runner. He's a gr- when you call the right plays. He's a, he's a great threat as a receiver. And everyone goes, this is why we drafted him. Everyone's going, he's given a great week or two of camp. And then you listen to Joe Marino talk on his podcast this week, and he just shredded him in terms of his pass protection. Chris, we talked about this before camp. It will be the thing that keeps him off the football field. Now, maybe his blocking thing, his blocking and the lack thereof will be helped by the fact that Dorsey is calling more 12 personnel. And he's doing more exotic things with the offense. He is. He's gotten very exotic in training camp. The problem is, is that when you look at the running back stable that they've built, Cook is probably the most explosive player, but when you look at pass pro, he if he's still bad, the way Joe Marino expounds on his suffering in this one department, you have a Damian Harris. You also have this guy Latavius Murray, who, Chris, I didn't realize this. When I hear Latavius Murray, I think old, old running back who's been on a couple teams, right? Yeah. Fantasy football, he's not relevant, correct? Mm-hmm. Did you know that he's six foot three? Didn't know that. No. He's a six foot three, two hundred and something pound running back. So it makes sense that his pass protection is the best of any player in the running back stable. There is a f- danger that if Cook can't respond in pass blocking situations where the team goes, we want to bait the linebackers to stay home by leaving Cook in the backfield, but also trusting that if a guy gets free or if an end comes around, he can pick that up and buy Allen a second or two. If, If Cook can't do that, then he's going to lose timeshare. He's going to be looking exactly what he did last year with Naheem Hines. And Latavius Murray, I'm not going to lie to you, he's had like some plays. I've watched him. I've seen the videos people have sent me, which, fuck you, NFL, don't. Everyone's like, no taping. Well, I got tapes. I've got, I've got people in the stands taking video from me. Latavius Murray has this running style where he's not the most explosive. He's not the fastest. He's emotional. And in camp, when the offense was getting beaten down, he was the guy who picked it up and put some smash mouth runs together. Put some, he had the pads popping on these runs where he'd hit a defender and make it known like, hey, fuck you. I'm an offensive player. 
We exist. Fuck you guys. You don't win the day. If he brings that energy and that execution into regular season football and Cook still can't pass protect, Cook will once again become a passing down option only. And even then, his role will be reduced. And it's disappointing because this is the thing that, like, when I guess you would have wished Bean did his homework, right, Chris? Yeah. You knew this guy couldn't do this well. Or at least he was never asked to do it in college. You assumed he might be able to learn it in the pros. He's not acclimating well. So now you have to go get yourself a Harris and a Murray to save your quarterback's life and also keep the passing attack moving. I feel like Murray's stock is increasing every single week that Cook continues to suffer in pass protection. This is something I'm going to be watching. Just how that all works. Guys, I love this. I love the fact that we are a very good football team nitpicking about bullshit, depth running backs. And at the end of the day, Josh Allen's the best running back in this football team, isn't he? Sadly, yes. Yeah. You'd like it to be a running back. With that in mind, I'm not worried about most of these things. I'm just very interested to see how they play out. Guys, I'm happy we get to get together We get to do this every week. I'm also happy that I can tear it on the fourth wall and say this. All night, I've been moving my laptop around in the screen. If you're watching us on YouTube, I've been experimenting with different my laptop in the screenshots. And the moment that I knew it annoyed Chris. Chris, at one point, you took your headphones off. It annoyed me. Look, there's a photo. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's on screen right now. (laughs) <laughs> I'm gonna tw- I'm gonna tweeting this out right now. You tell me if you put your laptop screen at this angle and let us know. I've just been- put the goddamn laptop in front of you like a fucking normal human being at a correct angle that works for your eyesight. I know you're it's fucked up because you got glasses on and we know you can't see shit. Just put the laptop in front of you like a normal human being. What I love is I've been doing this all night just to piss him off. (laughs) Just to upset Chris. The moment that I knew it bothered him, I was like, oh, no, I have to steer into this. I've been doing it for three podcasts tonight. I love this guy. Chris, you're the best. But also, I will still fuck with you from from now and again. I have to get mine in. Guys, I love this. I love the dynamic in the room right now, the silence from Chris. We got to get out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. And this has been your training camp week one roundup and your rock.